How, how would you describe heroin? Because everyone has their own descriptions. It's like warmth. It's like being warm. It's like being wrapped up in a blanket, cuddled, cuddled. You know, it's it's beautiful. You know, it is like it, it is sinking into a warm it bath. It is, and it's drunk. like it's like being loved. You know, yeah. Uh, but yeah, obviously, I'm that euphoria as well. Like, do you know what I mean? Yeah. You hear, you know, baby come out clucking. Yeah, but no one really knows what that looks like, and no one's described it. You could see that, could you? Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah, you can physically see it. Like, uh, so he was going a funny colour, you know, and um, sweating, sneezing uncontrollably, sneezing. squirming, wriggling around and all like, uh, yep. I've seen people die down there, um, overdose. When I was staying down there, um, I got stabbed. Um, stabbed in the face and uh, that wasn't good no I don't know what to say about the place really like without yeah well me and you have uh... <laughs> yeah do you remember any times <laughs> I remember one time uh, I was begging outside Tesco's on Tradica Street mm. you wanted to go down the docks you had some goods to sell down there and uh, he said listen come with me and I'll sort you out like you know showing this boy and then uh, his cousin comes up to you pulls a fucking gun out on you points <laughs> it in your face bro I'm like what's going I remember on like, that, yeah. you selling stolen goods I'm like this is my cousin this is my little cousin <laughs> yeah. and I'm like what are you doing that and took the frames off you know like I uh, remember that yeah yeah but yeah he pulled the gun out on me man yeah, yeah. in my fucking face yeah he was touching my face with I know it as yeah well. yep first time I'd ever seen a real handgun I was like yeah yeah The Central Club. What's going on, people? Welcome to The Central Club. This episode is brought to you by Reinspire Printing and the Fairwater Hotel. If you haven't already, make sure you hit that like button, subscribe to the club, and hit the bell button to be notified of future content. Today, I've got a very special guest for you guys. This one is very personal to myself, as this is about recovery and turning your life around. But not only that, I actually know this man. We've had run-ins in the past, and I think I would like to say that I've, I've, I've seen you transition, you know? I've seen you transition, and I'm really excited to get into this story. It's Scott Morgan. How are you doing, Scott? I'm good, thanks. Very good. Yeah, thank yeah. you for coming. Good morning. How good are you? Good morning. Yeah? <laughs> How are you? Uh, feeling absolutely amazing today. The sun is out, feeling good, belly's full, all good. Do you know what? It's... Um, it's really good to be sat here with you now in a pub. I think the last time me and you were in a pub, we were using <laughs> heroin together in a toilet. We were, yeah. Yep. Um, and, and, and to deep that and reflect on that is, uh, it's bizarre. Totally. We're yeah. drinking water. Yeah. Yeah. It, you know, it's- uh, Instead of smoking rocks. Instead of smoking rocks. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, your journey is, is uh, is one to be shouted and celebrated about and one that I want to promote as much as I can. As many yeah. stories like this, you know? Yeah. And it is hard It is hard to find, you know? And, Definitely, yeah. Yep. You know, uh, a journeys of addiction, you know, we're, we're lucky that we've come through that Very side. lucky. I count my blessings every morning when I wake up and I'm still here. I really, really do. Because I've had so many friends that haven't made it or so many acquaintances that haven't made it and so many people get lost in the system and I like... I feel absolutely blessed, I do. I yeah. really, really do. Every morning when I open my, my eyes, I'm like, I'm happy. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing. Absolutely amazing feeling. It's like... I think the other thing that we want to like really push with this story as well is, is you, you haven't just kicked your addiction and, and just kind of existed. Yeah. You're achieving massively. Yeah. I'm trying my best. Yeah. I've got a passion for what I do. And I, I'm still quite new on my recovery and I still need support, but I get my support through supporting other people and helping other people. Yeah. And it's something that I really, really enjoy. Um, I'm chomping at the bit to do whatever I can to try and inspire people, try and guide people, give them the support, mm. show them the love, show them that they, they're worth 
um, they worth getting out of the mm. problems in this situation because I didn't have that myself. So if I can pass that on to someone else, that'd be amazing. Yeah. Absolutely amazing, yeah. And, and what I've uh, come to terms with and kind of uh, experienced is, like, we're pretty, we're like, um, we're disruptors in this world of recovery as well because... Yeah. I, I never knew anyone back 10, 15 years ago who had been, come through the other side yeah. um, and is now helping others, you know, uh, got a good professional job, yep. et cetera, unless they had been part of like a 12-step program <laughs> yeah. or they, they fitted that, you know, that, yeah. that old-fashioned pathway. There's nothing wrong with 12 steps. There's Not nothing wrong with fellowships, yeah. but... The difference with me and you is, and the, which which we're seeing, yeah, um, you know, we've done it our own way. Yeah, yep. Would you agree with that? Or yeah, right? definitely. Yeah. So, um, what I did was something very, very similar to Smart Recovery. It wasn't structured. I didn't go to um, like meetings and things like that. But um, I, I started off with a motivating factor. Started off with motivation, so I knew I had to get clean. So otherwise, I was going to die, and my family were going to have a phone call saying. He's gone. I mean, that, I didn't ever want that to happen. And then um, I built on that by um, reducing stress and coping with urges. And I I was on methadone, so I didn't. I really didn't need to go and score. You know, I um, I started volunteering and things to cope with the urges. You know, giving myself more productive use of my time. Um, I started then building networks, getting supportive people around me, people that were really good for me and wanted me to be the best version of myself. And and then I kind of went on to um, maintaining that. And then and then from that, I had a balanced, healthy lifestyle. So I started looking after myself better. You know, I, w I wasn't going two weeks without a shower. You know I mean, yeah. waking up every day, jump in the shower, have some breakfast, never used to have breakfast didn't you sleep properly at all, like, you know, but it started doing all those things and slowly but surely everything started coming back to me. I mean, yeah. reap what you sow, don't you? You know, when you give out good, good things, you know, you start to be a better version of yourself, you attract more yeah. better things, just like a magnet, like, do you know what I mean? I think um, uh, when, when like my father used to say things like that to me for like when, you know, he was asking me to try and change and yeah. stuff, but it, it almost seems like, Nah, there's no way it can be that easy. There's yep. no way that if I just get up in the morning and, and think positive and eat healthy and have yep. a shower, yep. the good things are going to come to me. But it is really that simple. It, it really, really is, yeah. Yeah, it takes takes time. So it doesn't happen straight away, obviously. You know what I mean, you've got to be persistent with, thing, with these things. You've got to make them your new habit, is having healthy habits. So having routine, structure, things like that. And yeah, just being around good people, mm. like, you know? That's the key. That's yeah, the key as well. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, from what you've just said then, if people heard this, they went, oh, so you, it sounds like it just took you one time to try and change. But, no way. you know, no we're going to gonna go back now and, and we're yeah. going to we're gonna see that it wasn't just, you know, I just got on a methadone script and I didn't no, need no. to take heroin. This is no. a lot of times and yep. people need to know that yeah. in addiction, it, you know, it doesn't happen first time. No. And that's probably where it does get tedious in the sense yeah. of, this is what you've got to do yeah. because we've tried it loads of times before yeah, and it does right. seem hard yeah. then, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. Yeah. So you try and fail, try and fail, try and fail. It's a repeating cycle. And every time that you fail, you're just kind of confirming to yourself that you're, you're going to be an addict the rest of your life yeah. and that that's all you deserve. You're never going to get out, you know, and then that is a really, really vicious cycle yeah. to fall into that. It's like, because you, it's all about beliefs, you know. If you believe that you can you can do well and you can get out of it, great. But if you are, do not have that belief, if you believe that you're going to fail because you've done it so many times before, if you believe that you're not, you don't deserve to be happy, if you believe that your your life is going to end soon for from whatever reason, then it's, things like that are going to going to happen. It's called self fulfilling prophecies. Mm. Yeah, definitely. Okay, then. Well, let's let's take it back because yeah. your journey is um, it's extraordinary, you know. And uh, I think we need to go back to find out how you got into addiction in the yeah. first place. Yeah. Where are you from? 
Um, so I've lived all over, all over South Wales, but um, I'm from a very, very small place near Pontypool called Pentywyn. It's a little tiny village. Um, there was a post office <laughs> a shop that sold fags, booze and sweets and a school, a park and a few houses. How was it up there? So yep. that, that, that stereotypical valley lifestyle. Yeah, it was like a hamlet, not a... Yeah. village it was really? yeah and uh, it was like a really old victorian school and uh yeah we there was fields around with horses cows and there was sheep walking around and now you know yeah. dogs running wild and stuff yeah people will people will all junk out in their gardens and stuff like that yeah yeah and and how how does someone from a small village like that it sounds like a lovely place actually it, it it was yeah it was really nice yeah you know how how does it end up that way because you know similar to my story you know stereotypically you yeah know, nice nice area you yeah know, uh, good family yeah you're not going down that path so what was school like um i didn't have a good time in school so my school was very very small there were only 52 or 53 kids in the whole school. And this is going from reception all the way up to junior. Um, and I struggled a lot up there. I, I was the only kid in the village who had ginger hair. And I was always really meek and timid. And I used to get bullied mercilessly, I did, because of my ginger hair. And I was really, really skinny as well, like, I mean. So I really did not like going to school. I would try getting out of school all the time. I can remember one time I got vegetable soup and threw it in the toilet and told my mum I spewed up and that like and she was like, No, that's not sick. Get to school now. Um yeah, so I didn't enjoy it at all. I didn't like not at all. Yeah, and I think, you know, when you just said that, then you kind of reflect on your own childhoods and yeah. you know. I, I you know, I was partial to that as well. Like we all yeah. had as kids, didn't we? You know, yeah, yeah. we are nasty and we, we have no filter. Yeah. Um, but do you really think that had a big effect on how things went on? Definitely. That's when I first got my victim mentality. That was that was where it stemmed from. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. And did you have any friends in school then? Like, you know, um, was there anyone who was on your side? I had one or two. Um, but because it was such a small school and the area was so tightly knit, if you weren't if you weren't part of the group, then you were against them. So yeah, I get beaten up in school and I like, do you know what I mean? Um, teachers, I didn't get on with the teachers. You know, I had undiagnosed learning difficulties, so I was disruptive in school. Um, made to wear the dunce cap and sit at the front of the school, and sit at the front of the class wow. for the lesson. Oh, made to stand behind the blackboard, which was a big mistake, because it was a rolling blackboard, so I was just drawing dicks and boobs on it and then I'd roll it around. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, so... I really, really struggle with it. And I did not like it at all. Absolutely despised school. I did like, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Were your parents conscious of this then, would you say? Um, I didn't tell them. I didn't tell them. Obviously, they thought there was something not quite right, you know, but um, I, I wanted to be strong. I wanted to be a man, you know? And yeah. I... People didn't talk about their feelings or men didn't talk about their feelings back then. It's just going back a while ago, like, do you know what I mean? And I knew that even as a boy, you know? And I always wanted, uh, I wanted to play rugby and be strong and big. And I like, and even when I played rugby, I just, I was no good at it, like, do you know what I mean? <laughs> and yeah, yeah, it was really hard. Good parent, good parents though? Your parents there like, or? They, they were good parents. So they, they did... They brought me up the best they could, but they struggled themselves. They were both really, really young. Um, they hadn't had um, the best childhoods themselves and, and the right things in place in their upbringing. So, like, so I think that they didn't quite know how to deal with me, especially when I started having these behavioral problems. Um, yeah, I think, I really think they tried their best, you know? Yeah. Yeah, it's fascinating, isn't it? Like, you know, like they how... Me. They yeah, of course. And, yeah. And, and, and in their eyes, they were probably... They probably thought they were doing the best for you, yeah, you know? Yeah, definitely, if yeah. You've got the house and stuff, but it's yeah. probably those those skills that they probably didn't have when they were parenting. That's that exactly they lacked right, yeah. in with like you. Like the emotional skills. 
Yeah. Yes. Yeah, that's but it. Yeah. He's got his house. He's got a roof over himself. Yep. Got he's got food. Yep. That's it. Yeah. That's all you need. Yep. Yeah. I understand that. Yeah. Well, something happened to you at the age of 12, which is very, yeah. very young. Yeah. Uh, what, 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 what was that? Right. So um, I had moved area. So I, any friends that I did have, yeah. I was removed from and didn't have them anymore. I was spending a lot of time on my own. Um, I had a phone call one day in my parents' house and it was one of my friends from where I used to live. Um, and he said, oh, Scott, I've got some bad news for you. Dave is dead. That was my best, my best, best friend from when I lived in Pentu and he lived right opposite me. I used to go to his uh, house before school every morning. Is this the one you who know? looked after you then? Like the yeah, one, yeah. The yeah, only he was are... a really good influence. He was a good boy. He was like... And um, I was devastated, absolutely devastated. Um, I didn't know, you know, I didn't know how to deal with it. You know, I wasn't emotionally yeah. intelligent uh, uh, enough at that age um, to know what I was going through. You know, it was the first time I'd felt uh, those kind of emotions, like, you know, and I didn't deal with them very well. Um, I kind of bottled it up and tried to hide it, but obviously it festered in me. Um, I didn't feel like I could talk to my parents, um, honestly and truly about my emotions because I was worried about looking weak. Um, I went to the GP and um, told him exactly what I was feeling, that I had no self-worth, I didn't want to get out of bed in the morning, you know, I just didn't want to be there anymore. And he diagnosed me, me with de depression and high anxiety and he put me on a Valium script. And then started taking the Valium, obviously. You was given Valium at 12 years old? Yeah, a five mil three times a day, yeah. Yeah. I just, you know, I don't know if that's lack of education, maybe. Things were different back then. Yeah. Valium was like the new wonder drug for depression back then. Yeah. You know, they were doing what they were told to by the pharmaceutical companies. Yeah. They thought they were doing, helping me. And they really did. For a short while, very, oh, of very short while. Did, yeah, yeah, because like I take one of them, I'll be okay. No, but that's short term fix that leads to a long, long, long term problem. So what? I, I just want to know. Look, if I if I popped a, a five mil yellow now yep. myself, I'm on a wave. I'm feeling yep. wavy. Yep. How did that affect the twelve year old? Um, I was smashed, smashed all the time. Yeah. Forgetting things. Go, could you go to school? Sleeping a lot. Yeah, I was going to school, yeah. Yeah. I I can't remember a lot of it, to be quite honest with you. It's just bizarre to me, that is, yep. isn't it? You know, yep. so you, you've lost your best mate who was probably the only person or one, one, one of two who were there for you when you yep. was getting bullied, which is just, you know, so hard to take. I can't, you know, I've never been through it. How did he pass away, if you don't mind me asking? Uh, so he used to love his bikes, and he, um, he'd ride on his motorbike up the mountain, doing jumps and stuff like that. He broke his arms, legs, and all stuff like that over yeah. periods of time. But he was on his mountain bike, flying down a hill in Gardifreth, and tried to brake at the bottom of the hill, uh, you know, obviously going really, really, really fast. Um, the brakes didn't work, and he hit a lamppost, and he died instantly, he did. Yeah. You know, it's, 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 it's one of those, isn't it? You know, Colin McRae was a, a rally driver and, and dies in a helicopter crash. Yeah, exactly. Steve Irwin it, wrestles yep. crocodiles, gets killed by a stingray. Yep. You know, to die on a, mo a mountain bike, it's like, make it make sense. I know, I, yeah. Yeah, if he died on a motorbike, then that would, you know, that would make sense a bit yeah. more. Like, yeah. I'm sorry to hear that, mate. Honestly, you know, um, I, I can only imagine. But, uh, I bet you. I bet you still think about him. You know, where, where would do, he yeah. be now in, in yeah. your life? You know, I I used to think about him every day for like twenty years. And you and and, and I think the fascinating thing about that is, as you're now a fully grown man, hmm. you're still remembering your friend as a little boy. Yeah, because he never ever grew up. Yep. So that's, that's the memory right, yeah. you have of him. Yep. I I bumped into his mother a few years back. I did like, and she recognised me straight away. Oh. And seen her for. Just over 20 years, she recognized me straight away. 
So you fell into deep depression from this? Yeah, I did, yeah. Um, yep. Did you continue to take the Valiums? Was it a course of Valiums? It was, it was a short-term course of Valium, right? So it was like three months, I think it was. Um, but the thing that I learned from that was that I could make my mental health better Through. by taking drugs. That's how it always goes. Definitely, yeah. Yeah, so <laughs> when my course of Valium stopped... I was looking for something else. Yes. I was looking for something else to kill myself. I thought, yeah, I need to kill myself. I, I didn't realize I wasn't curing myself. I was giving myself a different illness, a totally different disease. Yeah. That's, uh, that's very familiar to me, that is. Yeah. So from the Valium, what, what did you go on to next then? Um, when I was about 14, I found magic mushrooms and LSD and speed. And I had a whale of a time. Had a whale of a time. And then I started smoking weed and then just went crazy on it, you know. I was I was known, so young. I was known in my area for taking shed loads of acid, shed loads of mushrooms. I did a thousand mushroom brew seven o'clock in the morning on one day own. and went to school. Yep. And just tripped like hell in school. It was great. Great fun, you know. Wow. At that, at that stage as well, did you like, did because you said you was getting bullied quite young. At yeah. that age, because you're getting older, you're starting to take drugs. Did you fit in more? Or was you- I did, yeah. So I found that by taking the drugs, I was fitting in with a crowd, yeah? Mm. And I started to get some respect. At first time I had respect from like, especially older peers, mm. You know, like the older boys are saying, oh, come and have a smoke with me. You know what I mean? Come and do some trips with me. Let's go Scotty's, for mountain. Scotty's just done a thousand brew, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it. Yeah, come on. Let's do five acid yeah. as well. Like, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Let's go up a mountain, have a chase off the coppers all night. Like, do you yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. It's mad because this, this trap of acceptance, this trap of making yourself feel better yeah. is, you know, the, 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 the toll of that is, yeah. is you just getting worse and worse. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And, uh, frying your brain yeah. at a young age. And like, by the time I was 15, I was selling the drugs. And then I really did start getting respect. Really, really did like. So was you selling these yourself? Was this, um, you know, did someone bring you in? Um, Yeah, so someone brought me into it. Um, A friend of mine, his mother's boyfriend, 45 year old man. He was groomed. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, was taking me and my friends out to raves. Um, didn't realize at the time it was really strange for a 45 year old guy to be taking 50, 14, 50 year old boys to a rave, like and playing them with acids and speed and pills. But, you know, I just thought it was great fun, you know, I was having a good time. And um, yeah, so started getting supplied by him. Um, he had a, he had a two bedroom house, uh, about a mile down the road from my parents' house. And he offered me an opportunity to go and live in the house um, with an older friend of mine and just sell drugs for me. And that's what I did. The day I was 16, um, I, my parents went to work in the morning. I was supposed to go to school. I wrote a note to my parents saying, I'm going out to live in a big wide world. You know, I always told you I, was, I could do this and I could stand on my two feet now. You told me I wouldn't so, amount to nothing. Yep, I'm off. Do you know what I mean? And I went, moved into this house that day as well. Actually, I dropped out of school because I legally could. Um, so, yes, just started selling copious amounts of drugs um, for this guy who was the landlord. Like, yeah. Yeah. Um, we have a lot of listeners, not just in Wales, but yeah. all over the UK, across yeah. the world, Australia, yep. America. Um, and, and a lot of people mm. ask me the question, what's the valleys like? What's Wales like? Uh, valleys. Um can you give like the, uh, you know, a description of, of the culture with the drugs and, you know, what's it like? So I love the valleys. They're so beautiful. It is really nice when you wake up in the morning, open your curtains, the sun is shining, all you can see is trees and rivers and grass. You know, it's absolutely a beautiful place, but there's not many opportunities up there. There's a lot of the, like my father's generation, generations before them lost their jobs because they worked up the pits. The pits, yeah. Um, so there was a culture of like being on a gyro. Thatcherism. Drinking, yep. Being on gyro, going down the pub, drinking a day away. 
And because there weren't many good job opportunities, people were stuck in dead end life quite often, like they were miserable. So obviously they wanted something to make brighten the days up, like, do you know what I mean? So we were smoking weed in the pub and and drinking and all day long, like, you know. Which which obviously leads to, you know. These other things, yeah. Because there is a reputation with with the valleys and with the towns and villages yeah. in the valleys as well. Is yeah. There is a reputation yeah. of it being a rough place oh yeah it was rough but if you're from there you're kind of used to it anyway yeah. so it's no difference i mean when i lived at the valleys i don't think i left the valleys at all for years and years and years like i mean so i'd never add any other thing to compare it to yeah. um but yeah obviously like there's a lot of rugby culture up there you know yeah. so it's like um very physical you know go to the pub friday saturday night have a fight you know what i mean and but then Wake up the day after everything's good. So how long was it um, kind of fun for you, would you say? Drugs and stuff. Right. So the drugs were fun until I got in debt and um, and I was introduced to heroin. And that's, that's the first step of my real... Um, that's the first time that I really didn't like taking drugs. So... When when I lived in this house and I was selling drugs, I would spend long, long periods of time awake and just taking speed, taking acid, days and days and days, you know, not going to sleep and ending up really psychosed, hallucinating, talking to myself. So the older guy who I was living with, um, he took me up in the bedroom one day, he said, oh, come with me, you know, I can see you haven't been to sleep for, for like, seven days so um i got something to help you sleep like yeah he was like go to the file go to this little tiny wrap of heroin he was like oh do this you know come on i'll run it for you on the file and now like and i had the line halfway through a line i was like Ugh, spewing up and i like do you know what i mean but um it made me feel a lot better yeah <laughs> chilled me right out yeah yep it did yeah you know, you was talking about, you know, you spewed up the first line. Yeah. I always find that with any drugs, but especially heroin, yeah. that's the cutoff point. That moment is when, the, when you decide it's not for you or it's for you. Yeah. Do you know how many people I've spoken to was sniffing Sebi mm -hmm. in prison and heroin? People I know who are not heroin addicts, yeah. people don't even know they've tried it, but they've yeah. said, I tried heroin, I had one line, I spewed up, I yeah. hated it. That's the difference there of people who... Because we obviously persisted and carried on. Yep. Do you know what? But a I lot of people don't like it. And I, I loved the spewing up. <laughs> Me I, too. Yeah. It was it was part of the buzz. It was enjoyable, like, do you know what I mean? For some strange reason. Yeah. It didn't taste very nice. It wrecked my teeth on that. <laughs> but if I hadn't spewed, then I wouldn't think I was getting a good buzz like. I, I mean, think it's because... It's even the association. You, yeah, and because you spew straight away, I think it's that first line, yeah. And then, yeah, and you have a shudder. But it's because it's so strong. Yeah, oh if, yeah. Even yeah, though you're oh, spewing, the was so much stronger you're feeling back in the day it, you're feeling or, that glow yeah, straight yeah, that's away. Right. Yeah, yeah, and, and And probably, you know, if you are off your fucking, same as me, I had crack. Yeah. Before I took it the yeah. first time. I was wanged out and had it. Yeah. Because it felt so nice. Yeah. Being dragged away from that horrible feeling. If yeah, you're up for yeah. days on end. Yep. You know, paranoid, and someone gives yeah. you a line, and straight away you're yep. in the room. That's it. Yeah, yeah. Of course, you're gonna fucking want that. I, I had the best rest I'd had in a long time. Yeah. I did. Yeah, yep. I was just like foot slipping into a nice warm bath. And I and I bet you didn't even have many lines, like one or two. Yeah, probably one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so one in two goes. So I go halfway down, spilled the other half how, line. And it was done. How, how would you describe heroin? Because everyone has their own descriptions. Um. Well, the buzz, mm. it's like warmth. It's like being warm. It's like being wrapped up in a blanket, cuddled, cutched, you know, it's, it's beautiful, you know? It is like it, it is, sinking into a warm it bath. It is, and it's like, it's like being loved, you know? Yeah. Uh, but yeah, obviously I'm that euphoria as well, like, do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's, it's, yeah, it's really good. I'm not gonna lie to like, you, like. And from that first time you took it? Yeah. Uh, was it a long time till you tried it again or was you on it from that moment? I wasn't on it from that moment on, but by the time I was 17, I was taking it every single day. I was clucking. So I had a habit. Um, 
I, Christmas time, when I was 17, right, um, I had to tell my mother that I was a heroin addict two days before Christmas because I what? was dreading waking up, clucking on Christmas Day and not being able to, and I mean, something wrong with me, like, do you know what I mean? Because yeah. I knew I was going to be ill and I didn't, I didn't want to spoil it for them. Yeah. Um, but in my crazy mind at the time, I thought the best thing to do would be to tell my mother that I was an addict. And to be quite honest with you, I think I was hoping for her to pay for some gear for me. So I wouldn't be ill Didn't on Christmas happen. Day. Like, definitely not, no. What? Yeah. Was it, was her, where was you at this time? What area? I was in Abakan. Was it, yeah. was it hard or easy to get heroin at that time? Oh, my word. It was very, very easy. Was it? was it? easier to get than weed. You had to struggle and make phone calls back and forth, phone box all the time. Uh, like ran it, walking round up and down this hill to get weed. People be saying, "Oh yeah, meet me at the same time now." Like, and then it be like, "Oh yeah, I'm got it yet." And uh, heroin, it was there. You had to go to one pl- one flat, and even if it was no one in the flat, there was someone in the flat downstairs or the flat above, and there was gear there constantly. Wow! It was really, really big. Uh, where in the in the town that I was standing around in there, it was the biggest thing. And this was back in the nineties. It was heroin chic, you know. So you had all the all the bands come out and I, you know, the Brit pop and all that. Like, do you know what I mean the Verve, Stone Roses? Um, it was cool to take. Oh, it was very very cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was it was uh, niche. You know, it was. Yeah, yeah. It, it, you know, if you know, you know. Yeah, yeah, that's right, yeah. yeah. And there was a whole culture with it. So it was like the the fashion, the music, you know, smoking weed all day out in the park and like I want a few lines and I like, yeah. Um, uh, the people supplying heroin, mm. uh, was it different back then to now? You know, we have county lines now. There's always probably been it, county lines, but back then was, it, was that the case as well or was it just a local no. guy? Went somewhere, yeah. imported it. And- yeah, that, yeah, it was totally, totally different. Um, so obviously, like, this was up the valleys. I'm not sure um, if there is a county line problem in the particular area where I lived, because I haven't been back there for so many years. Um, Pretty sure there will be. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. But um, no, at the time, it was like, there was one, one big, or two... Big guy. Yeah, he's one the, or two main dealers. One or two main dealers, and if they didn't have it, then there was always someone who knew someone who could get a team for an eight or whatever, yeah. and they'd go and get it, and then they'd sort all the boys out. Like, yeah. so yeah, it was always around. Yeah, interesting. So you 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 didn't stay uh, long around that area, did you? Because you you ran onto other yeah other spots, obviously. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, what what was that next step though? Is this when you met your girlfriend or stuff? Or? Yeah. I met my girlfriend when I was 19. So I had gone to Newport, done the Zanzibar, um, clubbing, sell some pills and I like, sell some acids and fat. And I met my girlfriend and I fell in love with her straight away. You know, me and her. She's a Newport girl? No, she's from Cumbran, she is. Nice. So that's the valley over from where I was living. And um, she was mad on the drugs as well. First time I'd ever seen a girl kill a bong in one go, you know, and I, I was blown away by that. I was like, oh my God, she's the one for me. Like, I love that. I did like. But the culture's mad, isn't it? Like, I know, yeah, like, yeah, crazy. Um, yeah, so. Sat there in, in an Adidas poppers, popping bongs, like. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Masking tape background. I love it. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so I moved to I moved to Cumbran with her. Um, she'd been given a flat uh, when she was seventeen because, um, like, she'd been having family problems as well. Like, um, and not long after I moved in with her, like, I found out that she was pretty bonkers. Uh, she had mental health problems, and like, obviously, I had mental health problems as well. We were both chaotic drug drug users, and I and. We had a lot of good times, but it was up and down. It was re- it was like when one minute it'd be amazing, next minute she'd be like paranoid, throwing accusations at me, throwing hammers at me, smashing things on my head and I like. And um yeah, it was it wasn't a good Was you ever abusive to her? No. No, it wasn't no. No. It was always the other way around. I I was brought up never to hit women. 
really, really was. Trust me, there were times when I just wanted to grab it by the throat and just <laughs> throw it around. Yeah. They were like, um, I, I hit her once um, in self-defense, punched her in the arm, but that was because she was on top of me with a block of wood trying to cave my head in, like. Um, so, no excuse for that, but it was self-defense. No, I get it. Um, but yeah, so that drove me down a lot, that did. You know, yeah. my self-worth was really low and that just made it even worse. Um, when I look back on it, it was controlling behavior. So she would hit with the one hand, love me with the other hand. And I was isolate. I was estranged from my family then. Um, I had... I was did your family know about it? Like, did your family like it or... Um, the- they knew there was something wrong with her. Yeah. Did um, they ever give you like an ultimatum? You... No, no, they didn't. So they let me make my own mistakes. I think if they give me an ultimatum, I would have gone against it anyway. Really, really would have chose her. Oh yeah, yeah, would have. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So I forgot what I was saying. You talking about your partner? You know, it's it's quite volatile. Oh right, yeah. And then a baby comes along the way. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, so we had my boy in 2003 and um, I, th- I thought things were going to get better. When, when she fell pregnant, mm. did you ever have that, 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 that sense of dread? Like, this isn't good. Or did you, was, you, was it just total blindness? Like, you know, was it bliss? Was it like, no, <clears throat> this is going to change things? Um, I think it was a bit of both. Um, so we didn't find out she was pregnant until she was five months pregnant. She knew. <laughs> well, she probably knew. Well, she wasn't. She wasn't having periods at the time because we were flat out on heroin and and on speed. We were injecting speed every day. So it doesn't help, does it? Because yeah. you can never tell. Really. That's it. Yeah, and she wasn't showing either. It was like when I woke up one morning, I was like, looked at her, and she's like. I think you better check if you're pregnant or not. Like, do you know what I mean? Because she looked a bit pregnant, like only a little bit. She looked she, pregnant. Yeah, <laughs> only a little bit. She, how did that go down? <laughs> yeah, I bet I, you. I was, don't know how that. I happened. bet you like, was praying that it was a pregnancy because if it was negative and you said that, she was giving you another fucking right hook. Yeah, yeah. She she went to the doctors. <laughs> doctor did the pregnancy test and said, "Oh, you're five months gone." It's like Fuck five you know. months gone. So maybe we both had habits. Flat How out. can this happen? What kind Ill. of damage are we doing to the boy? Like, but the advice she was given by her doctor was don't t- stop taking the heroin because oh. don't stop taking the heroin because the baby will clock. that's going to affect the baby. Like, yeah. Um, and that could cause further complications. Like, so obviously trying to keep it at a minimum. That didn't happen. You know, um, I tried to, I tried to, control the amount she was using that was no good just scream shout and cry and throw tantrum start throwing things around and I like until she got what she wanted like so I mean um, it was really really hard really really hard time it was he was, he was born addicted my yeah, brother was, was born say, addicted what was, yeah. the, what was the birth like um, the birth was traumatic so she had a 27 hour labour um, she had the first epidural too soon. Um, so then when she had the second epidural, um, it didn't work. Um, when, when he was crowning, so when he was just about to come out, she had a hysterical fit. So it was like an epileptic fit. Um, me and her mother were rushed out the room. Crash team was brought in. Um, it was like all hell broken on the side, you know. Um, so me and her mother were, I went outside and her mother was going, oh, this is your fault. This is your fault. You did this, you know, I'm going to lose my, my daughter, my granddaughter now. It's all your fault. Like, I was like, oh my God, man, you know, have I, have I caused this? Like, you know, and I was like, oh my God, they're going to die. But fortunately, um, everything was okay. Um, he was born, he was... Seven pound fourteen ounces when he was born, so he was a healthy weight. But obviously, he did start having withdrawals. And I tell you what, when you as an addict look down on that on that life, on that precious child, yeah, and you see it, 
him squirming and sneezing, right? It is the worst feeling that I, I, I one of the worst feelings I've ever had. It was because I knew exactly what, what he was feeling like, do you know what I mean? So he was, he was looked after in the scoop unit. He was put on Oromorph. Um, uh, and then I think he was weaned off it and he was out in three weeks, like. You hear, you know, baby come out clucking. Yeah. No, uh, no one has ever, no, well, people have obviously, but no one really knows what that looks like and no one's described it. You could see then, could you? Yeah. That... Yeah. Yeah, you could physically see it like, uh, so he was going to funny color, you know, and um, sweating, sneezing uncontrollably, sneezing. squirming, wriggling around and I like, uh, yep. And when you say they give them Oromorph, yeah. Oromorph is a strong drug. Yeah. You know, um, uh, doses of Oromorph, doses of methadone or any opiate, heroin, yeah. kills people. Yeah, if they right, haven't yeah. got a tolerance or yeah. they're new to it, it kills yeah. them. What, what what kind of dosage are they putting them on then? It must um, be quite small. It, it, yeah, it was a very small dose. So they used to give it to him in a syringe. Just a orally. tiny drop, like. Yeah, and I think it was about 30 mil, something like that. Still like, a lot of Oromo for a baby. Uh, yeah, that's not three zero ml. That's like th uh, three mil, yeah. Okay. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Just to help it. Yeah. And obviously then they cut that down over the period of days and weeks, like a... Uh, how does a baby get like I get I get it because it's you know, the mother whatever the mother has yeah. but, like I don't get how is it because it's in the blood is it because it's like the smoke goes into the stomach and he inhales the stomach I, I don't I don't know well, how he gets addicted. Well, we were doing an IV, we were, so it was going straight in the bloodstream, and obviously um, things that are in the mother's body get shared through the umbilical cords uh, to the fetus. And anything that the mother takes in goes into the baby system of this caffeine, wow. um, alcohol, even, you know, like nutrients, you know, foods and stuff like that. Like, I mean, so the baby directly gets it, like, you know. Wow. And, and uh, that, didn't make, that didn't make you change? It, we tried. We tried to change. Um, so when, when she gave birth... She just stopped the gear. It was like something in her biologically um, changed and um, she didn't need it anymore. I was put on a Subitex script. Um, I was put on it, like, I think it was the day before he was born. Um, and we tried, we really, really tried. But we were addicts. We were addicts, you know, and we were chaotic. We tried our best, but we didn't know how to bring a baby up. We didn't, you know. Um, I wasn't seeing my family, and she has a poor relationship with her family. Um, we knew the basics, but it wasn't long before we started arguing again, started taking drugs again. It, it was just smoking weed at first and then it was smoking weed and then when the baby's gone to bed do a pill or take with the speed and obviously that spiraled out of control really really quickly like you know um it was out of control they, they had no excuses for it um i had been so used to taking drugs that uh, that's all i knew yeah. you know um i didn't i did i wasn't aware of the consequences of my drug use in regards to the baby, you know? So I thought I was doing the best for him because I was f functioning I, as best I could, you know? Um, I was functioning during this time. You know, he was going, you know, when he was growing up, he was going to school and I like, do you know what I mean? He was always clean, fed and I like, you know? Um, but obviously like, you know, the drugs were involved. And uh, that's not good. Things got really chaotic and mm. um, things were getting violent between me and her. Um, and he was getting in the way there. Um, so uh, one morning, um, 
seven o'clock in the morning. I'd, I'd been asleep with him in bed. He was like under the quilt, under the quilt. He was two years old. And um, she'd been up all night on speed. And she thought there was someone in the attic. Um, she thought I'd been hiding a girl in the attic. Um, she, she, I could hear her like shouting there. And I was like, oh, just ignore it, and, you know. And she burst into the bedroom with a wooden statue, jumped on top of me, tried to smash my head in with it. And he was just underneath me in the quilt. So I picked him up. I took it, grabbed my phone, took him outside, locked the door, phoned the police because she was trying to smash the window. She was trying anything and everything she could to get me. She was like spitting at the window now, like, I mean, shouting on top of my voice. This was all seven o'clock in the morning. My boy was terrified. And I was terrified. I didn't know what, what to do, you know. Had to phone the police. They came, they removed her. She was bailed not to come anywhere near me or my boy uh, for a month. She ignored it. Um, she was back and forth every morning. And again, she was like shouting from the front gate and I like, I mean, knocking the door, trying to get in. And it, I eventually let her back in, you know. Um, I... I was dependent on her for a lot of things and um, I thought it was the best thing for my son to have both his parents around but things went like that for a period of a few years and he was taken into foster care a few times um, his grandmother so her mother looked after him for a while and um, she took me and me and his mother to court, and um, took my rep- parental responsibility off me. And um, he went to live with his grandmother, and he did. I couldn't protect him. I couldn't protect him. I think, <clears throat> although it's terrible. Mm. Um, it's for the greater good of your son that he's been definitely taken into some safe custody. I am so the, I'm so grateful to them. And it's the I, grandmother. It's not. And and the grandmother. <coughs> it's not. Grandmother, it's not someone you don't know. No, the the grandmother hated my guts, but I am so grateful to her right now for what she did for stepping in. And I hated her, hated her, hated her so much at the time. I despised it. Well, can I, mean? I can I tell you something? Yeah. I'm in the exact same boat, mate. Yeah. Me, me, I, I had a daughter when I was young. Yeah. With a girl. Very volatile, disruptive. Yeah. Wasn't love. Yeah. It was just, a, you know, being young and stupid. Yeah. Um, I fell into heroin. She mm. had her major issues. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, You know, she fell pregnant when we already broke her. Yeah. She had the baby. I'm I'm physically not there yep. at all, yep. and mentally, yep. I'm just no. I'm not there. Yeah. And the grandmother took her, and the grandmother, grandma, the grandmother's brought up my child. Yeah. And to say that publicly is is embarrassing. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it's shameful. Um, it's, it's shameful. Oh, yeah, I am ashamed of what I did. Yeah. It's embarrassing. It's shameful. But I own it, which you're doing right now. <laughs> yeah. Um, we're not alone, and you know. When the time's right, you know. I appreciate you telling me that. I do. I really, really do. Um, my son is a really good boy. A good, well, man now. Um, the grandmother brought him up amazing. She wasn't too good at bringing her own daughter up, but she brought him up. He was, he's a gentleman. He is like, he's so polite. He's well-mannered. He's good. He doesn't go out drinking. He doesn't take drugs. He's well looked after, you know, he's a bit bigger than me and I, you know, and he's, he's well dressed, he's got a nice girlfriend, got a job, um, doing really, he's done really, really well at school, learned to drive, bought his own car. I'm so proud of him, I'm like really, really proud and, of him. And against all the odds, can you imagine having the upbringing that he had and actually for him to, mm. you know, have all these things, I never had those things when I was young. I never learned to drive. 
I jacked school in. I was getting messed up on drugs all the time. Mm. And I had parents who loved me and that tried their best for me. Mm. I, I wasn't able to give that to my boy. And yet, he's, the opposite has happened for him. I'm mad sure. Mad things work out, it, it? it is mad how things yeah. work, and I'm sure I'm that, so grateful. Yeah. And I'm sure that he loves you unconditionally. Yeah. But if you probably asked him now, he probably wouldn't have it any other way. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Everything happens for a reason. Yes, it does. And you don't see that at the time. You really don't see that at well, the time. Well, you clearly didn't see it at the time no. because you. this is where you kind of yeah. plummeted, really. Yeah. You broke up with her. Yeah. So where did you, where did you, because I know you through Cardiff <laughs> when you was at your lowest. Yeah. Um, you know, you lived on the streets, you've been yeah. homeless. Yeah. You went to Newport first though, was it? When I, when I split up with uh, his mother, um, this was a while before his, uh, uh, we went to court. Mm -hmm. um, so when I split up with him, uh, with his mother, I didn't have family to go and stay with. Yeah. Um, I wasn't from the area. So up in that county, you have to be from the area for you to be housed there. Um, so I went, I left the home, went to the housing office, and they told me the best thing I could do was to get a tent, tent and a sleeping bag or find a grandstand to sleep in. And that I'd be put on the housing list. I think the housing list was like eight years at the time. You know, so I was, uh, there was a pub that I used to go and sleep underneath. There was like car park underneath it. Where's this to? Uh, Ponywood in Cumbran. And um, yeah, I'd sleep under bridges in my tent. Um, I used to tell myself, yeah, it's just like going camping. Yeah. So I get my tent and I used to love going camping. Yeah. You know, so I like kind of try and convince myself, yeah, it's just like camping every day in a, you know. Um, but yeah, that changes when it starts to snow and it's raining, you know, and you need a shower and you, you're clacking, you know what I mean? And yeah, just totally different then, totally different. Yeah, for people who, who have never been homeless, some of the places, some of the, you know, innovative, creative yeah, yeah. places you've stayed. Yep. Wait, wait, can you name some places? Um, yeah, so by being q in Cumbran, there was like a little area around the side which looked all nice. It was like fenced off and there. Um, I went and made like a little cabin thing there and it was pucker. It was meant, it was like... Um, a little cabin it was. Like, yeah. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was really den. nice. It was yeah, yeah, that exactly. It was a den, yeah. It was it was really nice. It was. Um I had all my stuff laid out, neat and all I liked. I mean, all my, all my belongings here. So obviously I had like kettle and camping stone wow. and stuff like that. Um so I I stayed in there for a night or two. Um I went out in the day to go and score, I think it was, right? Yeah. Come back, and the people from B and Q were taking everything away. All my property. They didn't leave me with a sleeping bag or nothing. They just chucked everything in a bin. Destroyed my den, man. It took hours to build that den. It did like I was, I was gutted. So then I was like, oh well, I'm gonna have to go and sleep under a bridge, you know. Fucking hell, you know. Uh, just wherever you can get, which has some kind of shelter from the wind and the rain, and you know, you're never gonna go away from the cold. Um, but it's, yeah, it's sad, isn't it? Like whenever like someone completely. who's homeless finds a place or creates a place, or it just gets destroyed, man. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, I it would. Is, yeah. I, I'm not going to start like, you know, pulling someone's roof down and smashing their windows yeah. and you know ripping it's everything exactly, out of their house. Yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah. You know, I, I, and I get what people people's perception is: is you can't just live here. This is private property. Yeah, but, that's it. Like really and truly, like yeah. Have some humanity. See the, human, have, exactly. see the yep. human side of things. Yep. You know? right, yeah. It's fucking sad, isn't it? It is, yeah, yeah. Definitely. And it, it wasn't like I was having massive fires up there in the garage, you know what I mean? Or causing mm. noise, disruption, or having people up there and getting pissed up and that. Like, mm. I wasn't doing that. I was keeping myself to myself, like, do you know what I mean? 
So and how was you finding your habit? Um, selling scrap metal. So I would walk around, I'd take some speed, walk around all night, um, finding scrap metal. You're there now, really, like looking in skips and all that. What's well, this little bit? Not in the van. No, no, not in the van. No, not in the van. Like, yeah. Um, so getting the scrap metal, then stripping it in the morning, and then getting lift to the scrap yard and selling it. I, I found an abandoned factory. Um, yeah, it just closed down. I think it was an old furniture factory. Big, big ass factory on this industrial estate like that. Um, and it was, it was dripping with copper. It was me. It was so much copper and it was unbelievable. I was having t- so much copper, I couldn't carry it all, right? And it was a wedge worth of money, bro, yeah? And so I was like s- sleeping in there, you know, um, you know burning, mad, stripping it. When you see materials, it's like when I used to shoplift. Oh, mate, everything is know, worth something. Yeah, you know when yeah, <laughs> you go everything. in a shop and there's a top tier of like uh, alcohol or if you're nicking Yankee candles, top tier of Yankee candles, yeah. and it's just like, <gasps> yeah, that's like, yeah, like yeah. pound signs. Yeah, like, that's you know, like, and yeah, I can yeah. imagine it's the same with yeah. materials. Yeah, like, yeah. You see like people who go scrap metal in and yeah. all that. When they, I bet when they see copper, they're like, Yo, oh, it's stuff that money. we walk past every day. Yeah. Stuff, even like slate and bricks and stuff like that. Do you know what I mean? Mad, <laughs> yeah, I sold tile, roof tiles and the mantles, you know, stone mant, fireplace lintels. You mean I, like Well, sir? back in the day, I would have. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I've already got a price in my group. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I know someone who have it in a heartbeat. Yeah, bit. yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so you went to Newport. Yeah. Where, where, so you can, can brand Newport yeah. Cardiff yeah. where's the roughest place um, the roughest place is got to be Pill Newport yeah yeah Newport's a whole different kettle of fish mate yeah you think things are bad in some parts of Cardiff wow nothing like Newport so um, I, I, I stayed in my mate's flat on the front line right of um, Pill of Pill right right on the bottom of the hairdressers, right? And like, we were taking loads of speed at the time. I was still going up nicking the, nicking the copper now. I went out four o'clock in the morning this one time and I saw this, as soon as I stepped foot out the door, I seen this guy running down the road towards me. I'm like, what's going on here now, right? And then behind him, I see this guy pedaling behind him as fast as he could on a mountain bike, right? Mounts the curb, jams him into the wall, bro. <laughs> Gets a crossbow. He's got this crossbow <laughs> attached to his back. Pulls it out and shot him straight in the back. <laughs> there and then, right in front of me, just blaze a bolt and pop. Crossbow him in the back. Obviously, I didn't hang around. <laughs> I was like, gonna make a cool sharp exit here, mate. You know what I mean? Fuck it was, you know. Yeah, it was mad. And every morning when I would leave that flat, I'd walk down the back, back of the front line. It stunk a rat's piss. Stunk every single day, man. And it's a this, densely populated. It's a very area. densely populated area. And you see, like people coming out the bushes and that pins everywhere. Found a few butchers' knives, massive meat cleaver. The ones like, do you know I mean, just in the bush, you know, on the side <laughs> of the road. Do you know what I mean? Because they used to stash their weapons there, so they were close to hand, like you know. Really, really dangerous place. Really, really dangerous place. Yeah, and even now, I went down there not long ago. Uh, got a Got a few mates down there through prison and working yeah. for Kaleidoscope. Yeah. Um and it's it's even it's even madder now. Um I think every week or every it's every other week they have like a, a bus that gets dropped off by the transport bridge of uh, migrants. Right. So it's like an influx every week of and wow. there's no exit plan there either. I know, yeah. So they're not like distributing people into no. other communities. Wow. So like if you go down there now. Apparently, like you know, like the locals, you still get the locals here, and yeah. it's, it's like um, it's a very multi. It's like docks. So for people who yeah, don't yeah. know what pill yeah, is, it's diverse. Pill is like the the, it's ca- the, most the Newport diverse. version. It's the most diverse place in Wales. I think maybe even the UK. Really? Yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah. So many different cultures. Yeah, and that yeah. very very tightly packed. So like City Road, you know, there's like. Like over a hundred languages spoke on City Road. It's yeah. saying down there. Yeah, it is. Um, yeah. But it used yeah. to be a, a big Jamaican community down there, didn't there as yeah. well? Like yeah. uh, a Somali population yeah. as well. Benji Weber, we've interviewed, is from yeah. there. I remember Benji here. Yeah, yeah. yeah he mad guy. Uh, he just won the Mobos, so congratulations. Like, yeah, fair yeah, play. yeah. They just won the Mobos. Fair play, smashing it. Yeah. Um, but um, 
you know, now, when I drove down the, the, the uh, not, not so long ago, you've got like the gang of Romanians, then you've yep. got another gang of yep. different cultures. <laughs> it was like the warriors, mate, yeah, honestly. That's it's tribal warfare. Tribal that down yep, there. Yep. And like a part, you know, and like the locals, I think they've, this, some of them are still on front line, I think, but they're also <laughs> operating behind now and being yep. moved out, like, because it's just an influx every yep. other week. It's, it's, it's wild down there, mate. Yeah. You know, there's a lot, a lot of prostitution and, yeah. you know. Yeah, well, that's always kind of been a thing, like, but. Yeah. Yeah, it's always but been I think, I think, yeah, like, pill is the same as probably the docks was years ago with people from all over would come. Let's go down here to yeah. get the drugs, you know. Yeah, it's yeah, like, yeah, that's it's right, like, yeah. It's like Bristol, St. Paul's. Yeah. Going to St. Paul's to score. Yeah, so people would travel from the valleys down to pill. Yes. To score. If they were ever, if they couldn't get up their way, pill. Let's go. And it must pill, be like, a nightmare for yep. the locals, you know, especially completely yeah. uh, for, for, for docs as well. Butte Town is a great community. Yeah, um, and, yeah, yeah. And, and, and it's had a bad name for, for many, many years. It it's has, been, yeah. It's always a minority that ruin it for the ruin majority. Ruin it for the majority. Yeah, yeah. They're, of course, they're really good people in all these places. Of course, like, yeah. And, and I and met some absolute legends and some diamonds in these yeah, places. Exactly. Like, so I mean, and, and they're closely knit. You know, they, they've got good community spirit. But obviously you get these small pockets, uh, groups and I, you know, small dodgy little lanes yeah. and I like, and you are, of course you have one bad experience, don't you? You get robbed once down there and that's it, you go and tell everybody and then it's they the tell everybody, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. it, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, guess what happened to me? Someone pulled an axe out on me, do you know what I mean? And then, yes, yeah, that's what happens, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, I understand that. And, and added on as well, let's just take away the 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 point in the finger of you know because it's docks and it's cultural and is you know yeah. that's the black area let's take away that yeah. if i said i you know i'm from fairwater yeah. lam remy's rough as fuck yeah well the person from lam remy will say it's not really that rough like and, yeah and people would say fairwater's rough yeah. as fuck and you yeah. know that's not a cultural thing that's just no. areas anyway so right, that yeah. element is there anyway yeah. of the dock so it's rough down there yeah well because like, everywhere's rough i i live uh up the top really and oh, that after is the rough. Ruets, <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, no, I agree. <laughs> Shout no. out to the ED crew. Yeah, definitely. No, so, you are. like, obviously, it's got a really, 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 really bad reputation. Yeah, and like we've had the riots come out there. Well, the second riot was on quite there. sad to see because yeah. you could see locals was, who've been there for a long feeling like yeah. it's us again. Like, and it was brought on by tragic circumstances. Of as course, well. it was. Yeah, and yeah. rest in peace to yeah. those boys. Definitely, yeah. Um, but. One thing I can say about Ely, it's an amazing Best place community. to live. Yeah. The people that they look after each other. Yeah. They've yeah. got all these little community centers that give out foods and stuff yeah. like that. And got the, all these little projects going on. Yeah. There's over 260 charities yeah. in Ely and Cairo. Well, well, and the, it's the most under-resourced area in the UK. Yeah, it's what disgusting. What the hell is going on there? These are the best people. These are the ones that could really make a difference. If you don't facilitate that and empower them to do that, and they got no hope, then bloody no, hell, is. what the you know? It is under resources, definitely. Yeah. They got no pubs there. <laughs> no, I'm joking. <laughs> um, no, it, it definitely is. I, so we got Liam McKay, who uh, I grew up with, he's like Kyler Boy, like he does a lot of youth work and stuff yeah. for the kids and stuff. And, you know, I speak to him about it as well. And he's very passionate about his area. You know and You know Liam. Yeah, yeah great guy, him, yeah. man. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, again, like, you know, he says it all the time as well. Yeah. There's something, uh, some people have been trying to reach out recently. One community, I don't know. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. But like, you know, they, you know, these people seem like they, they, they really care about the community they do, yeah. and they want to they make do. change. And, and they don't to us people. Again, it's, stigma that that yeah which what we're, we're trying to change doing this yeah that that does that so yeah just i just wanted to put that out there for like pill docs and stuff yeah they're they are mad places they are yeah but this isn't like uh, everywhere is mad everywhere, if you go yeah. if you go looking for it everywhere yeah so pill was like that was would you say the maddest place you was then yeah 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 definitely yeah yeah so what made you come to cardiff then um so the thing that made me come to Cardiff was the Huggard Centre um, and the uh, resources down there for people who were homeless. Okay. So like obviously you had a lot of um, uh, food runs, uh, you know, the Salvation Army bus. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of hostels down here. Yeah. There are places that will take you even when you've burnt your bridges everywhere else, okay, which, yeah. you know, I had done. I'd been into a few hostels yeah. and just messed it up through my, yeah. my chaotic life. Um, so, yeah, I came down here to access the hug that I did. I don't know what to say about the place really, like, without 
Yeah, let, let's, let's, not, let's, not, yeah. let's not even yeah. mention the base. That's the reason you came to Cardiff, though, because yeah, there was more right, yeah. opportunities, yeah. yeah? Yeah, that's right, yeah. I, I met you uh, yeah. as well, you yeah. know. Um, that's how I got to meet you, because obviously I was still using. And yeah. one thing I would say about you is... You were, you were always very respectful. Yeah. You know, some people in, on the streets are wankers, horrible Completely, people, yeah, yeah. and bullies. Yeah. Some people are evasive. Yeah. You, you, you were someone I could approach, we could talk, and, yeah. you know, I'd speak to anyone, me, because I'm just yeah. allowed. I was Same allowed. year. Same but year. But you was a, such a nice guy. Thank you. Um, maybe I want to talk about um, what the culture's like with people who are homeless, talking from a wider perspective, the general public, yeah. how they treat you. Um, generally, I wasn't treated too bad, but obviously there, uh, there's a section of the population that really, really looked down on homeless people. Um, there's some really, really generous, loving people out there. Um, people that will give you food and look after you, spend two minutes of their day talking to you to find out who you are. But then there's people who really, really do not like you, make you say, oh, look at him, he's just a junkie, and I'm like, oh, why didn't you get a job? Get off your ass, you know. Um, um, <coughs> I, I was sat on Tredega Street one day, right? And this guy walks up, right, with this group of his mates, gets his dick out and starts pissing right next to me, bro. Do you know what I mean? What the hell is that all about, like, do you know what I mean? A friend of mine was asleep in the doorway with a quilt over him, right? And someone came out and peed on him. I mean, peed on him, like, that's horrendous, like, you know, absolutely crazy. How do you come back from that? You know, we talk about, you yeah. know, f you know, f you know, trying to bounce back from things, mm. you know, for people who are just any old dickhead who's out on the night out pissing yeah. on you. Yeah. Uh, do you know what? Uh, you just do the same as what you normally do. Get off your head. And try and forget it. Yeah, no, it is truly sad, like how the how the public perceive homeless people and drug addicts. Um, and I think this is something that might never change, you know, because you'll always have those bad eggs. Yeah, and they have bad experiences with homeless people and drug addicts as well. So the we don't. When I was there, the people that I would see in my circles didn't help themselves mm. in that respect so i always made sure i said have a nice day yeah to as many people as i possibly could you did. i remember yeah. like I, i've actually seen you yeah talking about times i've seen you i've actually seen that like when people walk past you yeah. just say hi how are you yeah you, you wasn't someone who would just like sit there and hope someone would give yeah. you some you and, would always I, speak to people and like, i wasn't someone who'd walk up to someone tap on the shoulder be like oh got a pound for me yeah got a pound for me and then when they say no no i'm going to be like oh yeah you have yeah you have do yeah. i've seen that happening down yeah. there like do you know what I mean? you oh then. come on i've got the cash point and i like do you know what i mean i've seen yeah, that yeah. do you know what i mean absolutely horrendous why wouldn't they have a bad view about exactly. people in that situation you know you go off your own experiences don't you mm. if your own experiences you've been robbed threatened um mm. But have been forcefully begged from, do you know what I mean? Or been spat at, sworn at, do you know what I mean? Then you're going to have this negative thought in your mind, you know, you know? So, I mean, it's, it's not going to change yeah. until homelessness stops. That's the only time when these views are going to change, in my opinion, like, yeah. it really, really is. I, I used to go around tapping, yeah. That's why, I, you know, before I became a shoplifter, yeah. I I always felt like I couldn't sit down because of, maybe if I went to another, no, not if I never went to another town because I'd done it in another town, but yeah. I was too scared if anyone did see me. Yeah. You know, how did it feel though? Did you, did you was you ashamed at all for sitting down? Did you ever feel like, wow, or no? Was it like, I'm at my lowest, I need the money, I'm doing this? I was at my lowest. I had no self-respect or self-worth. Okay. And I was anonymous. I was, I'm not from yeah. Cardiff. I'm from up the valleys, mate. So I mean, I'm not likely to see my next door neighbor going to buy a pint of milk in the morning while I'm sat outside the spa. So I mean, that wasn't going to happen. So I, yeah. I, I had to lower myself in my own opinion in my own mind to do it mm. um, okay. but as soon as I started doing it and I started making money I was like yeah man this is this is wicked yeah. I don't have to go out 
burgling and, and nicking scrap, nicking scrap and all. Like, do you know what I mean? I could just sit here, say, have a nice date with everybody. I learned that I could sit down, say, have a nice date with a few people, like, you know, have some food, you know, some people drop me some food and that. And I'd spend an hour there doing that. And then I could shoot off and go get one of each, mate. Do you know what I mean? And then I could repeat the cycle and do that four or five times a day, like, yeah. you know what I mean? So I justified it. Yeah, I justified justification. It. Yeah, yeah, definitely, yeah. yeah. And I was I was satisfying needs. I was surviving as well, you know? I, I was surviving. I was doing what I needed to do to get myself through that day without thinking about mm. doing myself in. I really, really was like. There's been loads of times that you've like, you've been attacked. You've been, I've seen you with black eyes. Yeah. Dangers of scoring. People well, don't talk about this. No, they don't know. The dangers of actually going to go and buy drugs. Yep. After you've risked your life or yeah. you've already done something ridiculous to yep. make that money to yep. get your drug. There's always a very real danger of getting robbed, beaten, stabbed. <laughs> Yeah, murdered potentially, like, do you know what I mean? Or even just falling down, smashing your head up and when you're on your only way, like. So to go and score, you have to do the Krypton factor, I used to call it, right? So run the gauntlet, right? So you'd have to walk down Boot Street, right? And there are many, many levels to this game, right? It's and like you, the final each boss. level gets harder, right? Yeah, yeah. And at the end, you score and you're the champion, right? But you have to get past the robbers, all the people trying to beg off you as a beggar, do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, all the yeah. people trying to turn your pockets out on the way down and all like, do you know what I mean? You have to be looking around the corner, oh, he's, oh shit, he's, he's coming, do you know what I mean? Let's go the other way now. You'd have to walk like 10 miles out, 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 out your way to go all the way around the bushes and that to get it and you'd be like sneaking around and all like dodging people and all like, yeah, it was, um, and dodging the police as well, obviously, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, because they've always like to pick and the pick public numbers, down here, the people oh, who don't like you fucking. Oh, the vigilantes. The vigilantes. Yeah, yeah, we know the about vigilantes. You. Yeah, yeah, the definitely. Yeah. I know one of them. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Shout out to Saeed. And, and the thing is, so when you when you're a drug, homeless drug addict, you're very vulnerable as yeah. well. Like, do you know what I mean? And things can get really, really scary. They can, like, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, me and you have. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Do you remember any times? <laughs> I remember one time. Uh, I was begging outside Tesco's on Tradiga Street and it was like really, really mega late at night. I was pitch black now, like, and I see you walking down towards me, right? And like, we'd spoken a few times, um, but we didn't really know each other. And uh, like, obviously it's really dangerous going down the docks. You wanted to go down the docks. You had some goods to sell down there. And I uh, said, listen, come with me and I'll sort you out like, and, you know, uh, it's like, right, well, you get in. Oh, I get on one of each at least. So <laughs> he's like, yeah, I'm in. So we go down the docks and you open up his bag. You're like, yeah, I got some designer Gucci frames here to sell. Like, <laughs> do you know what I mean? They're like a grand each, bro. Do you know what I mean? 20 quid each and all like, yeah. So he's showing this boy. And then uh, his cousin comes up to you, pulls a fucking gun out on you, <laughs> points it in your face, bro. I'm like, what's going I remember on? Like, that, yeah. You selling stolen goods? I'm like, this is my cousin. This is my little cousin. <laughs> yeah. and I'm like, what are you doing? That took the frames off him. And I like, I but, remember that. Yeah, yeah, crazy. I think he he had twenty quid though at the end. I, 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 I did yeah, get the things. One of each. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I think I think we had more, and we were hoping to get like a couple of pieces. <laughs> But we ended oh, we up. We actually, yeah. But I, that's I think right, we yeah, ended yeah. up with one of each. But yeah, yeah he pulled right. the gun out on me, yeah, man. Yeah, in yeah. my fucking face. Yeah. He was touching my face with it. I know, as well. yeah. Yep. First time I'd ever seen a real handgun. <laughs> it's like, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yep. I've, I know. Mate, I can't believe Maybe you remember the night, that. bro. Down on top square, like, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Dodgy as hell, bro. Do you know what I mean? I would have gone <laughs> off and nobody in the area would have batted an eyelid, bro. Do you know what I mean? We no, let it bleeding, like, do you know what I mean? Shocking. Do you know what? I remember that, like, and I was like, what the fuck, like? Yeah, and 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 the fact that I still argued because I just wanted. That's right. You know. Yeah, yeah. Well, I still want my things, like. Yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. The, the things you think well, of. Well, actually, you've done a lot together, haven't you? Do you know what I mean? You've yeah, yeah. Next, that's and, and I'm clucking. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, yeah. I don't that's care. It. No, yeah. You know, my men will freak out listening to that. Actually, <laughs> I always said I was alright. I remember, right, mate. Yeah, the cold steel on my fucking forehead. Yeah, yeah. I remember yeah. it. Yeah. And that's when we went to the gay bar. Yeah, yeah, so we did. Yeah, it sounds fucking crazy. So, yeah. so we ended up in the Golden Cross pub. Yeah. 
Yeah, in the toilet. <laughs> yeah, it's smoking just walked heroin. in off a street. How yep. dodgy does that look? Two men going yep. into the toilet in, in the a cubicle gay bar. together. <laughs> yeah, smoking crack and that was and doing a mic, not it? Yeah, doing the gear. Yep. Yeah, mate. What the things we do for fucking drugs? I know. Uh, do you know what? I don't think anybody really noticed us going in, thankfully. Or come out. Because it's, it's normal. Because no, it's normal to go in the toilet. I know, yeah. Toilet, Two, blokes, so, yeah, Two blokes. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, I yeah. think people were knocking the door trying to come in. But <laughs> yeah, fucking, yeah, yeah. You don't want any of this, lads. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely not. Yeah, yeah. fucking hell, yeah. mate. That was, like, when you mentioned that, I was like, oh my God, mate, that's fucking mad. Crazy, Because I remember mentioning it not long ago to someone. Okay, like, no, yeah. not long. It was about a couple of years ago. Yeah. But I was thinking, who was I with? Like, who the fuck yeah. was I with? Yeah. It was you. Yep. Mad, isn't it? And now here we are, sat here. Like I said, man. And, and do you know what I love about this? Do you know this this talk? Like, like we're not fucking daft. We're not no. stupid. No. We're holding an intelligent, yeah. adult, mature conversation yeah, that's about right, something yeah. inspiring. Yeah. And we're doing great things. Yeah. You know, uh, greater than some people <clears throat> who have never took drugs. <clears throat> yeah. You know, but me and you... We are perceived, if we were still on drugs or people who were still using oh, drugs, no, as still the low, even worth haven't the, got a fucking clue. And worth the oxygen that we're breathing, mate. Do you know what I mean? No. Yeah. This, who we are now has always been in us. It really, really has. We just needed to be able to bring it out of ourselves. And that's through empowerment and just having some self-respect yeah. and learning to deal with the challenges that we've had through our lives and in a healthy way instead of a really, really unhealthy way. Yeah. But we've always been of course the people we have. to the core, mate, yeah, always. Before I ask how it was drawn out of yeah. you, um, how many prison sentences have you done? Uh, five or six, I think. Um, didn't really take count of them, like, do you know what I mean? Because most of them were short sentences. Yeah. Longest I did was Mate, five weekends months. long enough in prison? Oh, yeah. Oh, well, if you include, if you include being locked up in the cell overnight, probably like 20, 30 times. Like, <laughs> I mean, yeah, of course, yeah. No, but what I'm saying is you said I don't really count them if you're doing like, I don't know, four months or something. Yeah. A weekend in prison is long enough. Yeah, so, oh, you yeah, know, yeah, definitely. Yeah. People who count times and that, yeah. whatever, you know. Yeah. It's horrible it's either not, way. It's no badge of honour, though, is it? Let's no, it's not, it. exactly. No, not like, yeah. um, did prison change you? Not at all. No, prison made me worse. Um, prison gave developed skills in other areas of criminality. I put it that way. So prison I, made taking heroin uh, exciting again. It did actually, yeah, because I couldn't wait prison, to get out to yeah. have a boot again. Like, prison, yeah, yeah, made, yeah. prison made crack a strong drug again for me. Yeah, yeah. Because you yeah. know when you're constantly smoking in, it's, yeah, it loses its. Buzz but when you've had yeah. it not for a while, I know, yep. So yep. they don't they don't see that side of it. I no. don't think anyone's ever mentioned it like no. that either. There's no they, rehabilitation in prison. There's not. They can they run courses and stuff like that. When you've got short little poxy mm. sentences, there's nothing you constructive you can do in there. No. Like, do you know what I mean? No. You're in there for a while. You just to be stay on a on rail a course. To be on a rail course, you have to be in there like a year or something. Yeah. Because yeah. the course is long, the waiting yep. list is long. Yeah. You know, uh, I said on TV the other day, you know, might be able to go to education. Oh, you yeah. Know, yeah. Do a couple of paintings and yeah, yeah. if you're yeah. lucky, yeah. you know, or work down the laundry. Yeah. It's, it's, it's sticking a plaster on you, mate. Yeah. Right. Yeah, that's right. You know, lock him up for a bit. Yeah. Best thing is, people, especially for shoplifting and you're the user as well, mate. Yeah. yeah. Right. The people who have got you locked up from the shop you just stole are dreading it because they know you're going to come out and do it again. Exactly. Yeah. Some yep. of them don't even ring the police anymore. And you're going to be better at it next time as well. Exactly. Because you're going to learn from the lessons last time you exactly. got caught. And you're going to learn from the people in, inside who you were. And, and and if anything, you don't give a fuck anymore because you know it's an easy fucking couple of yep. days and a couple right. of weeks and I'm yep. back in. I learned that I could do it stood on my head. Yeah. I did. I, I was shit scared when I first went to prison. Shitting myself, crying an hour on my way to the cells. And I like, I, after a couple of weeks, it's like, oh, this isn't too bad. Well, actually. I always say, you know, if someone goes in for the first time ever, take them in for a bit and bring them out. Don't let them get comfortable. Because as yeah, soon yeah. as they get comfortable, that's yeah. when they say, oh, that's, fucking do jail. Yeah. Easy, mate. Yeah, no, that's right. Yeah, Rather totally, than yep. saying, oh, it was fucking horrible, mate. Yeah, fucking, yep. I never had no fucking money on my canteen spends because yeah. it takes a couple of weeks. Yep. You know, I didn't know anyone, right? Yeah, fucking, that's right, horrible. Yeah. Yep. Don't let them get comfy and yep. bring them back out. Try that, maybe. Yep. But still, that's that sharp shark treating that's never worked, maybe. No, that's right, yeah. You know, it's like there's no rehabilitation at no, all. No. You 
say like someone does a fucking beating and they give him six years. Yeah. The, you, the community goes, he's away for six years. Oh, that's a lie. Yeah, yeah. Time don't stand still. No, he will be out again. It. Yeah, and when he's he, going to be out. You know, you he's going to be with, bigger, stronger. You see. More mentally tough. Well, if you haven't rehabilitated, rehabilitated yep. that person, yeah, you're right. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and these people, you always see it a month or a year down the line before they're upon release in the articles. He's due out. Don't let him out. Because... Yeah. You're dreading it again then, yep. and there's been no rehabilitation. Yep. It's like community service, yeah? Mm. Okay, you go community service, and, um, you know, you're, you're painting, let's say. You've got to yeah. paint the fucking council yeah. fucking fences. Yeah. Why don't you give them a fucking job yeah. with the council at yep. the end of it then? Teach them a skill. Teach them a skill. Train them. Train them up. Educate them, you know? Do, so, do something with them yeah. that is going to improve them, yeah. not just make them feel bad and ashamed. Because like community service, like, have you still got to wear them get vests? High-vis vests you when like they do that? Prick, That's it, you? you stick out like a sore thumb. Like, I mean, everybody's walking past you, like picking up litter with this, you know, mm. with a group of people with a high-vis vest on. They're like, oh yeah, it's little community service boys here. Like, well, well, like, well, boys well you know, if it, maybe in a, you know, a punishment of humiliation, maybe it's good, but... Give them something at the end of it. Don't exactly. just say, oh, you're on your way something now. Something constructive. Exactly. Because you know, there's you, no follow-up to that afterwards, is there either? No, anyone who does community service, at the end of it, they're so happy. I can't wait to finish. I've got an hour left. Rather yeah. than be like, I can't wait for this to finish. I'm getting a job at the end of yeah, it. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Well, I know we're running for time. We need to yep. fucking keep running here. But um, Scott. Yes. On to the, uh, the good part, really. Yeah. yeah. How did you change? Uh, right, so there was a sequence of things that was. Um, I had a goal in my mind all this time that I was using. I I was just trying to block out pain, and I had a goal that when my boy was 18, that I would be off all the drugs, right? Um, so I had motivation. I really had a good motivation. Um, and around that time, lockdown happened, um, so I was on a methadone script and um, I was able to come to a place in my mind where I was okay just taking the methadone. So I, I just like, but I don't need to go and take all the drugs on top. Like, I mean, my methadone was older me. I wasn't having withdrawals. Like that was obviously brought a lot of challenges. So I had a lot of free time then. So um, I started seeing what I was about in, in my community, started volunteering, volunteering on projects that I really enjoyed. So it wasn't just going and, you know, volunteering, picking up litter or something like that, you know, it was doing projects like, you know, gardening. There was a, a project that Kyra Hill fought, you know, so I was getting involved with history and all like, do you know what I mean? Um, then through my volunteering, I was getting support, so po having positive people around me, making friends who had similar mindset to me. Um, then um, when I was on the, when I was on, one of the, on the gardening project, um, I met a guy from Grand Avenues called Christian Roberts. Um, he told me a little bit, it, bit about himself, so he had lived experience. I could, ident I could identify with him straight away. I trusted him straight away as soon as he told me that. Um, he inspired me. He really, really inspired me. So um, I, I told him about my past and that, and he was, and how bad I felt about it. And he was like, right, well, HMPPS are actually coming up with a lived experience role within the next year or so. They need people like you you can use all this negative experience, all the crap you've gone through, turn it around and help people get through it. And as soon as I heard that, I had self-belief. It was like a light bulb moment going off. I was like, oh yeah, I want to do that. I wanted to give something back. I'd always take and take and take and it was time for me to give something back. So um, I went to uh, St. Vincent Centre on Mill Road in Ely um, the day after. He met me down there. We had a cup of coffee down there, started talking, getting to know the staff down there and started volunteering and every day. Then I was going down there making cups of coffee, um, just having a chat with people who were coming in through the door um, for support and that like. Um, again, building networks, being <laughs> supporting people. And then through that, uh, so I went there for about six months doing that. 
Um, there was a job coming up with Welsh Restorative Approaches Partnership, um, who were working out of St. Vincent's. Um, and obviously, I'd already built the networks with them. I already had a good relationship with them. So they gave me a job. Um, I went into hospital um, the last week of July to come off the methadone and onto the Bouvedal. The day, uh, the Monday morning after I got out of hospital, I started work as a restorative practitioner. I'd never have a t- had a title before. My title before was always druggy, you know what I mean? Or smackhead. I hate that word. You know, I so fucking hate all I those had, words. I'm junkie. I can't yeah, stand them, mate. It's derogatory as well, no? So they built me up. They built me up. They gave me everything I needed for my future. And I started working with them. I, it was only a six-month contract. But then that six-month contract led into another six-month contract. So I started working from St. Vincent's as a peer mentor. So I was getting involved. Um, they do probation appointments down um, in St. Vincent's called the Grand Avenues Project. And they've got a lot, all different agencies working out there. People who come in for their probation appointments or just out from the community yeah. um, can find support there. That's fantastic. So I How built, many people, uh, sorry, how many people, you know, can get into town, you know? They, people think people it. can just get to places. Yep. You know, it's the same with methadone There's scripts. There's so many barriers. If they you're from Ely, can... mate, you don't want to be hanging around downtown. No. I mean, it's, it's a barrier, like, do you know what I mean? It's, that's yep. fantastic. Sorry. I forgot what I was saying, though. Oh, you made was. me feel bad, no? <laughs> no, right. you were just saying about how it's it's like a hub down there, basically. Yeah, so um, obviously when I was working down there, I built up a relationship with the probation officers who were working for me. And I was told about an, an opening in, in HMPPS as a substance use officer, and which is right down the street. I'm an expert to experience when it comes to that. I went for it, and I got a job. And I'm a substance use officer now. And I'm traveling all around South Wales, delivering smart recovery groups. Obviously, I'm training at the moment. I'm proud of myself. I just, I'm doing something that I'm passionate about. I never have to work another day in my life, mate. And this is what I, 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 I don't know what camera to look at, but I want people to fucking zone in on this and understand like yeah. the levels and uh, just the achievement. Like yeah. this guy was someone who lived on the streets. He was someone that people would piss on on the streets. Yeah. He is someone who has been to prison and committed crimes. He has a criminal record. <laughs> And he is now working for probation. Absolutely amazing. Groundbreaking. <laughs> and I applaud say, probation I'm, for I'm giving you away. that opportunity definitely, as well. Definitely, 100%. So probation have had a bad rap in the past, but We've they, are making, them off. they are making changes now. They're starting to do things in a different way, in a way that works. Um, so they're trying these different things. And my role, uh, so a lived experience role, is kind of like a pilot scheme. Yeah. Um, I, I've got nothing but good things to say about probation. The probation officers that I work with are like family to me, you know? I see them do amazing things every single day. Um, I'm blessed to know them. I absolutely, they bless me so much by giving me the job, giving me an opportunity. Because like, why would you want someone that's got... Uh, criminal record, ex-drug addict, in recovery, why would you trust them to let because them into an organization? Because you're the one who has the key Exactly. To, That's right. They're waking up. And they resonate. And it's something yeah. that we've always said needed yeah. to be done. And yeah. of course, there are, you know, um, barriers to that. There's, there's, there's yeah. ways, there's old-fashioned viewpoints. And, yeah, yeah. you know, we only got to look at the Misuse of Drugs Act and how old-fashioned yeah. that is. Yeah. You know, and things are changing. Yeah. Um, I couldn't think of a better person for the pilot, mate. Thank you. Because I know you're not going to let them down. And I know that no. you are going to show them yep. that we're not all bad people. I'm going to prove myself. So and if I do come up against these barriers in with people I work with, if they don't treat me as an equal person and don't accept me as being able to do the job and trust me, I'm going to prove myself. I'm going to make sure they know they can trust me. I'm going to do the job. They're going to see results. And then hopefully you, yeah. these opinions uh, will yeah. change. Yeah, naturally, you know, my, my job as a co-production worker is, is, is doing that, is making sure that 
you know, the professionals, yeah, the staff, let's say, the ones with no lived experience, yeah. work alongside those with lived yeah. experience. And it's yeah. about, you know, breaking down those barriers. Definitely, and, yeah. And you're doing that yourself as well. Yeah. So we're going to do it. We're going to make change. And, 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 and Cardiff is the place for that. That's right, yeah. You know, this is where it's all happening it is, yeah, in yeah. Wales. You yeah. know, I do talks all around the country yeah. and some of these places are just jaw-dropped, cannot believe I know. how we are, you know, changing the ways. Yep. So, you know, pat on the back to you and thank also you. a big thank you to the services who have given us that opportunity. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. I'm so grateful because like, like I said, I never had very good uh, points of view about these uh, these organisations and that before, but my mind has totally been changed. Yeah. I owe I owe everything I have to these people. Mm. I really, really do. I mean, they've given me so much support. They've built me up from the bottom up. Like, do you know what I mean? Obviously, I did the hard work myself, but they were there to yeah. guide me, um, give me pointers, even say you know things like. Yeah getting up and having breakfast every day, like, do you know what I mean? <laughs> like, yeah. eating properly, starting good the little in the gym things. and that. Yeah, the little things, yeah. And these little things lead into bigger things. Do you know what, as well, this year, like, since you've been on this journey, I think we, 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 we're very similar in, in yeah. the times we stopped, because I'm three, yeah. That's three right, and a yeah. half. I'm yeah. three and a half years. Yep. Yours, how long? Um, so, it's got off the methadone 2022, but I stopped using about a year, year and a half. So, you're like two, two years, years yeah? Yeah, yeah. And I remember seeing you the first time when you come up to me and you went, Carl, I, I know what you're doing and stuff. I'm changing. I think yeah. the first time I saw you, I think that was, might have been in Tesco's. Or was it before that? Uh, Culver. Yeah, Culver, Tesco's. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, you were saying, I'm doing this, I'm doing yep. that. And yeah. Along the way, we see each other now, bump into each other, yeah. you know, every other like, yeah. monthly. And do you know the progress I've seen? I remember yeah. the, I remember sitting um, by the drope, um, by Marcos and the shops, yeah. and I was in the car, and you, you I came, remember that. You, yeah. you poked your head through the window, yeah. and you said, Colin, I'm getting my teeth done now. Yeah, yeah, I didn't have any teeth and at the yeah, time. Yeah, 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 and I, I was yeah. so emotional. Yeah. I was so, I don't know if you could tell me, I was so mm. fucking emotional. And it's like, I've seen your, your progress the whole yeah. way. And then um, I had a meeting with uh, your boss, didn't yeah. I, the other day? And yeah. and, she, and you was in the building at the That's same right, time, didn't you? Yeah, and I was yeah. like, I'm starting the yeah. job. And I was yeah. like, I, you know, it's just been amazing to see, you know, different different thank levels you. of it, like, yeah, you yeah. know, and it's no one else. You can thank these people for the guidance. Yeah, of course, yeah. But it's yourself who's you made this it change. It has to come from within. It and, does, and, yeah. I, and and. Like I try and say this to people now, but only they can, it's, you can't force them a time. No. But I try and, I'm trying to instill in these people yeah. now who we see on the streets is like, you can do this. Yeah. They're looking for us That's now right, yeah. Yeah. more than ever. Yeah. And it's sometimes it's hard for them to wrap that around their heads. Yeah. Like what, they're going to give me a job? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And we're, um, is there. we're they're able to see that with us. So I mean, if you yeah. just told them that, and it was just coming from someone who wasn't yeah. one of us, then you'd be like, oh, no, nah, that, that ain't happening. Like, do you know what I mean? But when you actually see someone that you used to <laughs> beg with or go and score with, yeah. and they've turned it all around now, well, and then they see it, they know it's achievable. Yeah. They know it can be done. It, it's a hard, hard road, you know, but they, that day, it's that seed. It's planting a seed in someone's mind. And you this, can do it. This I podcast, was the same as you before. And this podcast, I'm hoping that people will see because there's no doubt people saw me and you together. Like, yeah. I want people to see you as well. Like, because I've been doing yeah. it now for two and a half years and yeah. people come up to me like, oh, you know, but I'm, I'm so glad that I'm able to bring you on here for you to empower I'm people really, as well. I'm really, really happy to be here. And um, so I used to think that if I can help one person, I'd be happy. Mm. But by doing something like this, if I can inspire 10, 20 yeah. people and then they go off and inspire another 10, 20 people, it, then it, it just... Goes. Well, people don't understand it, like, and, and it's going back to that thing about the self-publicity thing again, right? People don't understand that the reason we do this is, you know, there might be that side element of it, of course, to empower ourselves. Yeah. But if we don't go on video and talk and show change, and if we don't r film other people and tell, you know, telling their yeah. stories of where they've yeah. come from and they're not bad people, then no one from the wider perspective are That's ever right. going to see no, the, right, the yeah. humane side of yeah. us. Yeah. And the, also, 
other service users or other people who are using. Yeah. They're never going to see that it's possible to change either. That's right, yeah. yeah. And that's, that's just going to further continue their beliefs that they can never achieve anything. Or, or the, on the other side, the beliefs of people who are not yeah. addicts and that to think, yeah, no, they'll never amount to anything. You know, they, they're always going to be like mm. that. Here's a question for you. Um, would you change anything? Um, Sitting where you are now, doing what you're doing now, would you change anything? No. Everything happens for a reason. If I hadn't have gone through what I'd gone through, no matter how hard it was and no matter how desperate I was, then I wouldn't be the person I am now. And I'm happy with who I am now. I'm proud of myself. If, if all these things hadn't happened, nothing would have fallen into place. I, I could be a totally different person. I could be desperately, desperately unhappy right now. Because trust me, I know people who've had been brought up with a silver spoon in their mouth. They've had nothing. They All they've been is wrapped up in Cornwall all their lives. Yeah. And they're desperately unhappy. But now, I'm just at the beginning of my journey, mate. And if I'm this happy now, why yeah. am I going to be yeah. so high? I can see it. It's glowing on you, mate. Yeah, yeah. Glowing. Yeah. I mean, I'm passionate about it. You know, I never used to be passionate about anything about unless it was going to score yeah. a few years back. Like, and it wasn't all that long ago, yeah. you know? I have got a newfound life. It's like being, I haven't been born again, kind of like, you know? Mate, honestly, I'm, I'm so fucking happy, Thank mate. You. I am too, yeah. So you should be, mate. Good I for am, you. Yeah. First time I've been proud of myself in my life. There's something we do with all our guests. Yeah. Um, we ask them to, uh, this is their opportunity, not just to speak to me, but to the people <coughs> out there. You know, any, you never know who's going to watch this. Yeah. So if you could give a message to people, um, a positive message, maybe to people out there who are struggling in addiction, yeah. who think there is no way anyone's going to give them the time of day. There's no way that there's life after or during. What would you say to those people down there? I'd say there is a way out. It's a hard road to go down, um, but life can get better. I know it uh, It might not seem like it right now. Um, things might be so bad for you that you might not want to be here right now, Like, but there is a way out. There are good people out there that want to help you, and you can achieve anything that you put your mind to. If you have the right motivation, um, then you can do absolutely anything you want to. There's nothing that can hold you back. You can go to the ends of, ends of the earth and back. You really, really can. And yeah, I just hope I hit something to someone. Scott, thank you so much for coming on, mate. You're welcome, bro. Um, You're welcome. I've enjoyed it. Good. Um, is it like um, for people who might want to reach out? I'm sure some people will be really inspired by this. Is it a way they can contact you on social media? Um, not at the moment. Okay. No. No, so my um, my accounts are private at the moment. Good. Okay, that's fair enough. All respect. Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, what I'll do is, if anyone wants to, you know, say anything to Scott, um, please leave a comment. I'm yeah. sure you can see that and yeah. you can get it back through the comments. Yeah. Uh, if it's private, just message me yeah. and I'll, I'll, I'll contact Scott and I'm sure if it's something, you know, that someone yeah. really wants to know Amazing, that, yeah. they'll contact you. But I, I say that if there are people out there that um, want the kind of help that I've had, that St. Vincent sent at Ely Bridge, Dusty Forge, amazing places to go. Yeah. And if they're not from this city, you would say avenues for them to look maybe? Um, go and go to your local hub, local library, find out about volunteering opportunities. Brilliant. Start building yourself up. Start doing something good yeah. with your time, you know, and get off of methadone. Because that, that's, that shit will kill you, bro. Maybe another another conversation Definitely for another time. Another that conversation, yeah. Guys, hope you enjoyed this podcast. I know I did. Some some surprises in there. Um, you know, this is this is this is buzz me. Like I'm buzzing right now. Um, so happy. Um, guys, it's possible. Anyone can change. Anyone. It don't matter what you're going through. It don't even just have to be addiction. You could be going through a divorce, a job loss. I don't know. It could be the minutest things that are big to you. Trust me, guys. Tomorrow's another day and you can change your life. Stay central. The Central Club.